Welcome to the inner world of filmmaking. I'm your host, Tammy McGarrow. I'm a writer, director, editor, and a podcast producer. In this show, I will interview filmmakers in all facets of production and distribution. I'm so excited to introduce our guest, Susan Littenberg, who edited such films such as Tadpole, 13 Going on 30, and Bride Wars. She has worked over the years with many talented directors, such as Ang Lee, Steven Soderbergh, Paul Oster, and Jim Jarmish. Welcome to the show, Susan. So happy to have you. Thank you so much. So I listened to the Blissful Spencer podcast, and, which you were on, and I found one of the stories that you told so interesting, where you watched a lot of television as a child and film, and when you went to the University of Delaware and wanted to be a filmmaker, but they didn't have a film department... Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that story? Sure. So I went to University of Delaware as a business major because I figure, well, my dad had recommended that uh, if you're good at business, you're good at anything. Well, that's that's his sort of businessman's point of view. So if you can, if you know, if you can do good business, you can make a lot of things happen. So I did take some business classes for a while. And then I realized that my real interest, as it always had been, was theater and film and literature and philosophy and art. And so I wanted to stay at that school, but I knew I wanted to focus on film and they didn't have a film program. They had a television communications department, but I knew I didn't want to do television, that I really just wanted to make feature films at that time. Television was not like it is now. I saw a flyer in the dean's office, the dean of arts and science that said, want to make your own major, something like this, apply for a Dean Scholar program. And I asked the receptionist, I said, I've never heard about this. Um, she said, not many people have. And so I looked at what the requirements were, and you had to have three professors as advisors, and then you had to make a presentation to the Dean with the three advisors present, explaining why the majors that already exist don't fulfill what you're trying to do. And so I had three advisors. I wrote something very inspiring and I got away with it. In other words, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think many people had done Dean Scholar. I don't think many people take advantage of it, but somehow I convinced them that I could take any classes I wanted. <laughs> so yeah, so what I focused on was any class that had film in the title. So I took a philosophy in film class and uh, there was an honors class comparing literature to film. Um, and of course, all the film classes that were offered in the English department, which were film theory, genre, world cinema, um, intro to film. So we studied film, even though we didn't make films. Mm -hmm. And then I took a lot of theater where I did direct and do some acting and, you know, learned about blocking and performance and all the things that go into filmmaking. And I took a lot of photography classes because I really loved still photography and and processing photographs and printing them. And I really think that all of those things contributed to me becoming an editor, even though I didn't take editing classes per se. And now I teach editing classes uh, at UCLA. So I'm, I'm teaching classes that I never took. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, I mean, that's pretty interesting. So what when you were doing the film degree, did you have in mind what you really wanted to do? I knew I wanted to make films in some way. I didn't like direct, I think, or write or I think I've always wanted to direct. I directed theater in high school. And I won a little gosh, it's in my other office, but I have a little Oscar, a pretend Oscar from when I directed a one act play in high school. And I had a fantastic teacher in high school, a directing teacher who really told us about balancing out the blocking on a stage and how to motivate actors without giving them line readings and all of that kind of thing. The arc of a story and a character's emotional arc and all those things that really apply to editing. But but of course, would apply to directing had I done more directing. So I think, yes, I always wanted to be involved in making films in some way. I don't think I was ever clear. I think I wanted to direct. I think I still want to direct. Uh, so I don't know if that'll ever happen, but I'm trying. 
<laughs> Maybe. Maybe. You're not dead yet. I am not even close. <laughs> right. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Um, yeah. So so then what led you? What was the moment or, or moments uh, leading you to saying, OK, I'm going to go into editing? Great question. So there was, like I said, a world cinema class. And in that class, we learned about the Soviet filmmakers who had all kinds of theories about editing. And in fact, I'm teaching that next week in my class at UCLA, uh, the Soviet filmmakers and the editing theories, which I always found incredibly inspiring. And it sort of tuned into my love of optical illusions and Mm -hmm. the idea that, well, first of all, putting two images together can create a third meaning. You know, that the idea that you put one piece of film next to another uh, and it just creates something new. I I find that to be kind of magic. And so I got very inspired by ideas of the Soviets, such as the Kuleshov effect, which is that if you take a close up of someone and then cut to a bowl of soup and you take that same close up and cut to a gun, that the audience will probably make the inference that there's a different meaning to what's being said in these sequences of shots. So when I first started working in New York City as a PA on low budget films, my second job was working for a producer named Jim Stark. And he said, what do you think you want to do? And I said, I'm not sure yet. I think maybe the art department or maybe the editing room. And he said, I think you're smart. I think you could work in the editing room. And he connected me with Jay Rabinowitz, who was the editor of Night on Earth, the Jim Jarmusch film in 1990. And that's how I got my break. I got this job as an apprentice and I never worked at all in an editing room. So I learned everything there on film. And part of me realized that I had a real knack for it. I was flipping out over how incredible it was to be able to manipulate images and sounds like that. But then another part of me felt like maybe it was too tedious and I'd rather be on set. And so I was still not quite sure. Um, And I ended up working in Jim Jarmusch's production office, helping him get through the New York Film Festival and things like that after the film was over. But then I got asked to work on a documentary and that lasted a year and a half also on film, 16 millimeter film. Uh, and that's when I, st- I really realized I had the bug to keep going. And so 30 plus years in the editing room. But honestly, over the last 10, I've been questioning it again. And that's why I'm teaching and now writing a script. And I've produced a couple of documentaries. So I'm I'm doing other things because I think my initial fear of being claustrophobic in an editing room, there's some truth to that for me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so at what point did you decide I'm going to teach and not edit anymore? Well, I had already decided that I wasn't editing at that point. I had had a child and she was still young. Uh, and I tried to go back to editing when she was a toddler. And I really admire people that can can do that, uh-huh. that can be a mom and a director or editor. I had trouble with it. I couldn't split myself in that way. And I was just feeling a lot of anxiety, quite honestly, and felt every time I took a job, it didn't feel right. And I ended up actually quitting a job, which I've never done in my life. And that really gave me the scare of not taking a job again, because I never would want to leave someone hanging. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's a lot more details to why I quit that job. I'm not going to go into them too much, but uh, it wasn't a good fit. But it also just it just kind of gave me real pause about going back into that. And so a friend offered for me to help him out at AFI and start teaching editing. And I was terrified at first. But I ended up doing that for a couple of years and then moving over to UCLA. And I absolutely love it. I love teaching. And it gives me the time to work on projects I've always had, passion projects in the back of my mind. So yeah, I'm writing um, a screenplay and I've got a, a pitch deck I'm working on and We'll see if this all comes to fruition. So you're directing this. I don't know. I'm writing something. I'm imagining that I would be a producer on it. I would love to direct it. But if a great director came along that I could work with as a creative producer, if that would make it a better film, I would Mm -hmm. happily pass that over. Because I think think it takes a lot of skills that... I've dipped my toe in, but I'm not super experienced in like directing actors. I used to do it in high school and college. And even after college, I directed some small theater in New York. I directed the Sam Shepard play Cowboy Mouth that he wrote with Patti Smith. Wow. And that was a cool experience. But, you know, my friends and I just got together and chose a play. And um, 
just paid all the rights and paid for a theater and and made it happen. It was very small, but very satisfying. But I really haven't directed theater since then. And I've done a couple of documentaries and a short experimental film. Depending how big it is, if we were to get name actors and really be able to get a real budget, I actually think someone with more experience would be a better director for it. But I would want to stay very involved and make sure it stays true to the story, which I would annoy myself. If I was the director or editor and there was someone whose project was too precious, it would be a red flag for me. But I might be that person. (laughs) Right. Yeah. I would think it would be hard that, you know, writing it and and also that you want to direct, you know, writing it, you probably are already visualizing the cuts as an editor too. You know, I'm trying not to do that. Oh, okay. I, I'm, I'm visualizing transitions as I write the script. I'm visualizing how one scene might get to another, but I also kind of leave it up to the DP. I mean, the DP and the director, if there is another director. I mean, one thing about directing that's wonderful is you make a lot of decisions, but really you're facilitating other great artists to do their job well. Mm-hmm. So you're having, a, you know, a DP that has a vision or an editor that has instincts and a vision. I wouldn't even edit it myself, honestly. I want to employ other people's instincts and br- whatever they want to bring to the project. So, yeah, I just really want to see this story be told. And if I could direct it, that could be amazing. But I'm not tethered to that idea. So do you, you know, working with a lot of famous directors, do you have connections to actors that you could pull into your film? Or do you have some ideas? Or if you're stepping back, would you even be hiring the actors? Or would that be more the director? Well, I in an ideal world, I would be cast, I would be helping to cast it. You know, um, in fact, in my pitch deck, I have kind of a dream cast that I've created uh, people I have in mind. Mm -hmm. Most of them aren't people I know. A a couple of them I peripherally know from from working on films. But um, I think it's better to find the right people that would fit the, you know, fit the characters and be big enough names that we could raise money. So I would want to be a producer on it where I would have a say in that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, w- w- could you tell us a little bit about the story? We're not there yet. Or we're not there yet. <laughs> Just leave us hanging. I'm okay. going to leave you That's hanging fine. for now. Next time. Yeah. Where are you at in the process? Because writing is daunting. at times. Yes, it is very daunting. How is your flow? Um, I lost a little bit of flow in the last few weeks, but it was actually going really well. So this is a project that I've had in mind for over 10 years. Mm-hmm. It's based partially on a true story. But I want to fictionalize part of it so that I have more freedom of telling a deeper truth of kind of what I want characters to go through rather than only what actually happened. So honestly, I maybe I should say it. I think it's okay. (laughs) I've been writing a screenplay and have had this idea for over 10 years to make a screenplay about the beginnings of a a workshop center called Esalen and Big Sur. And so I've researched a lot of the stories of how it happened back in the early 60s, and it's still running now. Mm -hmm. And so the fictionalized part of it is imagining people that could have gone through there at the time and what they might have been through, because the the story of the leaders that started started it is well known by certain people and they're wonderful stories. Um, But it is a bunch of men and stories about men. And so I wanted to have a lead female character, which is partially based on a real person. And the more I did research on this person, Mm -hmm. it was one of those uncanny coincidences where I found out that she actually did go to Esalen in the 60s or 70s. And I had no idea. Oh, wow. I just imagined this person going to Esalen and it turns out she actually did. So I'm taking real characters and then, you know, bending it a little bit. And it's pretty exciting. The process has been going pretty well since I've been focusing on it for the last two months or so, or three months. And even though it's been 10 years of me doing research and having ideas for scenes, I've actually got an entire outline finished now Mm -hmm. and the first 35 pages of a script written. Awesome. That is so great. Congratulations. Thank you. It's a lot to to even begin. And I think um, films are never just like, oh, I just had an idea last month and now I'm doing it in a couple of weeks. It's always this couple year process yeah. <laughs> of 
of getting it to a place where you can actually start, you know, filming it eventually. And I'm glad that you're doing it because a lot of times we have all these ideas and then we never do anything about it. It's really true. And I, and you know, I don't think of myself as a diehard feminist. I do think about things and always have. I realize that there's a part of me that that is, but just never knew to name it that. And I realized too, that for various reasons, including the fact that I've always been female, there's a lot of reasons that I feel like I've probably held back from telling the story that I want to tell or that I haven't had the confidence to say, yes, I can write this. Yes, I can direct this. I still don't have the confidence about that. But maybe we're getting there, though. You're not done yet, right? We're getting there. I'm just plugging. <laughs> because ahead. people like me, and I think about this for other people and for my students, if you have a story to tell, don't let fear or insecurity or underconfidence hold you back, right? So I'm trying to to move forward with confidence, but it's not easy. Well, yeah, I think it's a process. You have to give it time and there are good days and bad days, especially with writing. I mean, sometimes you're like, I'm on it. And then other times it's like, oh my God, this isn't working. I don't know what's going on. But it's good that you have an outline. I tend to, when I write, I just jump in and write. But in that, I don't know where it's going. <laughs> and I think, does the outline kind of guide you? And is that, how did you decide I'm going to write the outline first and then jump into writing? Well, it's also from studying editing of knowing what story structure makes something, what pulls an audience in. And I never did study the formulas of three act structure until more recently. Now that I'm teaching, it was more instinctual for me when I was an editor. Yeah. But now that I've studied those and I've done a lot of recuts on films and I, I've sort of studied films that I think work and I think, well, why does that work? Why does that film make me feel such a catharsis compared to other films? And so I did take a very short course online about story structure. I thought, you know, I sort of hate when something is just formulaic to be formulaic, but why not aim for the formula that will most likely draw people in and make them feel satisfied and then pull it back from there. So, mm -hmm. you know, I tried to hit a certain mark at page 17 that they suggested in the course. And then I thought about some of my favorite films, which are not necessarily Oscar winning films. But for example, there's a film that means so much to me and makes me so emotional. And I think what is working about this film? And that film is Purple Rain by Prince. I love Purple Rain. I love Purple Rain. I haven't seen it in a long time, but it hits a lot of notes for me, literally. I love music. I think the music is fantastic. I love when, a music, when music helps to tell a story. Mm -hmm. But then I think about how serious it gets when his father commits suicide and, and the transformation that he goes through. And the part that always gets me is when they're on stage at the end and Wendy and Lisa have been trying to get them to play their song and he never would. And he pushes it away and he doesn't see them like he doesn't see them in the way that they want to be seen and heard. Yes. And he surprises them by starting the beginning notes of Purple Rain. I'm going to start crying right now. <laughs> Me too. I'm getting a little choked up. But he starts those first yeah. few notes of Purple Rain and you see Wendy and Lisa look over mm -hmm. yeah. and realize that they've been seen. They've been squashed down by his ego the whole time. And then they're being seen, they're being put into the spotlight. And it's such a beautiful, yeah. universal human moment to not be seen and then be seen. So I realized like whatever it takes to get that, I want that in my film, in any film I work on. Yeah. Um, and so like, let's think of other films that have that, uh, you know, of not being seen and then being seen. And it's always emotional. Um there was another one. Do you feel like it's kind of like a little bit sometimes even the underdog stories? Sure. You know, like uh, Rudy. I never saw that. You've never seen Rudy? Oh, my God. No. He he wanted to go to Notre, Notre Dame. Uh, he wanted to play football. And he's like 5'4". He's short. But he has such a spirit. I don't think he got good grades either. So somehow he gets in and he keeps trying out and he keeps trying out to be on the football team. I, I'm getting chills thinking about it. Yeah, Rudy was based on a true story and it starred Sean Austin and Ned Beatty and uh, Lily Taylor. 
It was really good. You got to see it. You know what's funny? I think that that's the film that the teacher uses as an example in the course I was taking. One of those weird coincidences. Yes. Well, you need to see it. I do. Because it has great character development and shows the true spirit of a winner against all odds. And when you're told no time after time after time, but that's all he ever wanted and everybody against him. Give up. Give up. Or, or Rocky, for that matter. <laughs> Rocky. I love Rocky or, bre- or Breaking Away. Do you remember that movie? Breaking Away. Yes, I love that movie. Yeah. Used to exercise bike while I'd watch it. Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, those kind of films, right, that they have so much heart. Um, they're not high action necessarily, but it's about being seen. And, and I think when you feel that you can relate to someone there's there is a catharsis that can happen when we suspend our disbelief and become the character that we're watching. And that's what I love about film and what I want to create, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I love when we think something that isn't true, because most of us, I think we react to what we think we know, like what I think I know about you. But I don't really know because I'm not really asking the questions and I jump to conclusions. And I just think it's so cool when you have a reversal of character, when you find out kind of even like Prince. I mean, here's this guy. He's brilliant. Got an ego and a temper. And then we meet his dad and then we meet his mom. And think about growing up in that kind of household that nobody else realizes and maybe doesn't talk about and nobody really knows is going on. And then they think what an asshole he is but what if it's all the other stuff going on that when when he kills himself and I mean how sad was that even that last scene when he's like crying the father's crying at at the piano oh yeah I gotta see that again I don't remember the very end yeah it, it was really sad like what's the pain of the father too Absolutely. We don't hear it. We don't get that story. And then the mother who stays, who loves this guy, even though he beats her up. You know, it's all those things that are making character, making the person be who they are for good or for bad. But, you know. Yeah. And then you find those things out and and you're hoping for change, right? We hope at the end there's transformation. Exactly. <laughs> but not always. Right. And yeah, and every every film doesn't have to have the same formula or a happy ending or anything like that. But but honestly, one of my other favorite films from that era as well, which is a little more cheesy, but I don't care if people think it's cheesy, is On Golden Pond. Do you know that film? Oh, yes. Oh, my God. But wasn't that working out her and her dad's relationship in real life? Yeah. So then it had more of an impact when I, w- when I was watching it because I knew the backstory. That's very true. But also, it's about her being seen by her dad. She says he doesn't he doesn't care. He doesn't care. He doesn't give a shit about me. And she, and, you know, she says something like sometimes you have to almost spell things out in a script, I think. You know, I, I would be amazed if he said, uh, wow, I'm so proud of you, Chelsea. But he would never say that because he's a goddamn asshole or something. I, I'm, paraf- I'm paraphrasing. Right, yeah. And then at the end, she goes up to him and she tells him she got married. This is the best scene in the movie, the most emotional. And he says, oh, that's Sam Fantastic. You know, I'm good for you. And she's totally shocked. Mm-hmm. That's the moment that she thought she'd never be seen and she's seen. So, yeah, I'm looking for those in films for inspiration. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to see your film. How do you? I hope I can. What? (laughs) I can find that moment. I hope I can find that moment in my film. I haven't figured it out exactly yet. I just know I want to get there. And that's what I mean by an outline is I know the kind of emotional points I'm trying to hit. So if I know what the characters are and I know some of the real stories that I want to weave in there, um, if I have this idea of trying to get a character who hasn't been seen to be seen, then if I point that out at a certain page, then I at least have a some goal I'm trying to get to in a way. Yeah. Now, do you read other scripts to see how they get there? Or is it more that you're watching movies and go, ah, that's it. That's what I want to nail. Or do you, can you see it in the script? That's a great question. I mostly watch movies, but I have it on my list to start reading more scripts. So thank you for the reminder. You know, a film I saw recently, and then I found the script online, and I really want to read it. It's not a famous film. Uh, Maybe you heard of it, but it was called Men Don't Leave. 
with Jessica Lang. Yes. It, it wasn't that mm-hmm. big of a film, but I watched it again recently and I was pretty blown away. It's a mother son, mostly and a single mom. There are some brilliant moments of performance and dialogue in that film. So I thought, let me look at this script because it's also very simple. Sometimes I realize that the best scripts don't have a lot of plot that that happens. There's a very simple plot and it, and it's something just to hang the emotions of the characters on. So that's that's what I'm more interested in. Um, mm-hmm. And so I, I have that script waiting to be read. Oh, that'll be interesting. And others. Yeah. One of my favorite films was it's Alan Ball's film, American Beauty. Oh, yeah. And I just thought the layers and the writing, I just and Six Feet Under when he did that and just the layer of, you know, character and especially in Six Feet Under the series. Did you ever see that? You know what? I never did, but I know it's very popular. Okay, well, it, it's good because just when you see it over seasons, you see how they arc and they change throughout. Um, I just think Alan Ball is brilliant with writing character and kind of really um, darker stories. Yeah, if you will. Did you see Towelhead, yeah. which he directed? It sounds familiar, and I think maybe. Uh, what was that about? That that was a war one. No, it was about a. Oh, no, no, no. It was a young oh, girl. Was that the one? And the neighbor? Yeah. The neighbor that came over and she was 13, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 That was pretty intense. I didn't see the film. I saw the script and I interviewed with Alan Ball to, to cut that movie. But I had problems with the script, which I voiced and I didn't get the job. And that's okay. But I did get to meet with him once, <laughs> but I didn't get the job. So what's he like? He was... Very nice, but I don't think he responded well to to my criticism or what I had problems with with the script, which is fine. I'd rather not work with somebody that, yeah, or maybe, I, yeah, I assume that's why I didn't get the job. Okay. Well, on that, I was going to ask you a question that when you're editing films, do you read the script before you say yes to the job? Oh, God, yes. I would never even interview for a job for uh, editing a film without reading the script first. I've never edited a film that I didn't like the script for the, the only one where I didn't love the script, but I wanted to work with the director was bride wars. Okay. And it's okay. That film's okay. I'm not going to, I don't want to diss it, but it's not a great film. It wasn't an amazing script, although there's some really funny and heartwarming elements to it. Bride wars was, a script that I enjoyed, but I wouldn't have gone after it if Gary Winnick wasn't directing it. Gary and I worked together for over 10 years um, and we were sort of like a team, a creative team. And uh, he passed away about 10 years ago. So that's part of when I stopped editing as well, to be honest, because working with Gary was like, um, there was no language necessary between us. We, we, we thought the same. And when we didn't, we argued well, you know, and he really had so much trust and respect for my ideas and gave me so much autonomy. And honestly, a lot of his taste wasn't the same as mine. Uh, He liked romantic comedies more than I do. And that's why I've cut so many romantic comedies, you know, Bride Wars, 13 going on 30. We did Charlotte's Web together, which isn't romantic, it's classic, but also with Sabrina Plisko, who's a brilliant editor. I couldn't have done that film without her. But uh, all those films were done with Gary. And I think if I had chosen, if you look at my resume before working with Gary, I was working with more like New York indie auteurs, you know, with uh, Hal Hartley, Jim Jarmusch, Ang Lee, uh, and then Steven Soderbergh, which isn't a New York. He's not a New Yorker, but um, he is now. He wasn't then. Mm-hmm. And then I started working more on Hollywood kind of comedy dramas with Gary. And again, that was because of the relationship. And I enjoyed those jobs so much. But it wasn't my favorite genre. Oh, I love the romantic comedies. 13 going on 30. I own it. I've seen it so many times. Same with um, the other one that you did. uh, Easy A. Easy A. Oh, my God. I love that film. Love that film. Well, that I do too. And actually, I didn't know that director before, Will Gluck. Um, I read the script 
And within 10 pages, called my agent and said, I want to cut this film because the script was fantastic. So that's a perfect example where I thought, this is coming off the page. I can see this. I can hear it. The voiceover was so brilliant uh, and done so well, and it really popped off the page. So I, I had a great feeling about that one, and it was it was right. So do you ever feel like, okay, there's uh, you read the script, you go, oh, my God, this is so great. But it's also the actors because it can make or break the film. And like with 13 going on 30, you have Jennifer Gardner, who is fabulous playing a 13 year old. And then in Easy A, the smart witted Emma Stone. I can't see anybody but Jennifer Gardner and Emma Stone being the leads for those two films. I completely agree with you. They're fantastic casting, both of those films. When you're working with directors, how, how, can you give us some examples of uh, the different directors you've worked with and how involved were they? Were they sitting in the edit the whole time or do are you allowed the first cut and then bring them in? Or are they telling you what to cut? <laughs> yeah. So what happens is during the shoot, um, the editor starts on day one, setting up the cutting room. And by day two, we are cutting whatever they shot on day one. We're keeping up to camera. In fact, I listened to one of your old episodes briefly. I didn't hear the whole thing with another editor that you interviewed who said um, that he had this bold idea that people, that editors should cut as things are shooting. And I wanted to yell out and say, that is what happens on most films. So I think just whatever experience he had in, in all of the films I've worked in on in New York and LA, we start cutting as soon as they start shooting. And we're keeping up to camera. That way, if a shot's needed or if something isn't working quite right, there's still a chance while they're at that location with the cast to maybe rework something if they can squeeze it into the schedule. So um, we keep up to camera. And then hopefully you have a week or maybe two after wrap of shoot to get your editor's assembly together. Mm -hmm. And you put music, you put sound effects, you make it feel as much like a real film as possible. But at that point, you really aren't supposed to cut anything out or reorder the scenes at all, which is something we always end up doing. Right. But right now, yeah, they, they just want to see an assembly of the script as written. Um, I made the mistake on Bride Wars of taking out a scene that I didn't think worked at all. And Gary was so mad at me. <laughs> so I never did that again. He said, I want to see everything the first time I watch the film. Why did you do that? I'm like, I'm sorry. So uh, right. they really need to see everything, even if you know in your back pocket that you want to pull that scene out later. Mm -hmm. So it really depends if the director is also the writer of the script. So with Gary Winnick, Nigel Cole, those are directors I've worked with multiple times. Neither of them wrote the scripts that they were directing, and they were always very open to crazy ideas of reordering the scenes, changing the dialogue, losing an entire subplot. I love moving things around and trying new things. Even if you end up putting it back, yeah. trying things with the material can open up new ideas um, and not being overly beholden to the script. Mm -hmm. When you have someone like Joel Hopkins, for example, who's a director I've worked with a couple of times, he's also British. He did Jump Tomorrow, which was at Sundance in 2000. And he did um, Last Chance Harvey, which I didn't work on with Dustin Hoffman. But then he and I did The Love Punch with Pierce Brosnan and Emma Thompson. Mm -hmm. That's when my daughter was two. And I was in England and Italy for that for a little while, which sounds fun, but it was kind of a nightmare. Anyway, that film, oh, both of Joel's films, because he wrote the scripts, was m he was much more attached to the scene and everything was much more precious because he had spent years. Like I understand that. That's why I'm saying I would be a red flag to, if I were on the other side of it all, because when you're very attached to things you've worked on for years and you've worked so hard to get it into a certain shape and you've written it, you've directed it. And now you hand it over to an editor who's just getting rid of dialogue, changing it and moving it around. It can be very painful. I bet. So I really think it depends. Anyway, the cases that I've worked with people who are the writer director versus just a director. Also, usually first time directors or early if they're early in their career, they're more insecure and less open 
to trying things than people who are very experienced. Steven Soderbergh gave me a lot of autonomy, especially on the, and he usually edits everything himself. But when we did And Everything is Going Fine, which is a documentary of, of Spalding Gray. Oh, this is my Gray's Anatomy poster behind me of Spalding Gray. Yeah. I did two Spalding Gray films with Steven Soderbergh. And the second one I did, which is the last one, And Everything is Going Fine, is completely archival footage that we gathered um, posthumously. And because Stephen hadn't ever directed a documentary, he handed over a lot of creativity to me. And, and I worked on that for a couple of years off and on between other films just at home. And he would come by and we would work together. And then he took over the edit at one point, And then I got it back to tweak it. And we were kind of passing it back and forth. That was a really satisfying project. Ah, and and to have Stephen over at your house must be nice too. That's pretty cool. Like totally, it was yeah. totally cool. Now, um, okay, so did you ever work? So do you work at home and you have Avid on your home computer, or do you go in like in some films? Do you have to go to a studio to edit? How does that work? Yeah, uh, there's some films that I've cut at home. That Spalding Gray documentary was a good candidate because it was just something I was squeezing in between other projects. Most of the bigger films I did at the studios or in an editing room that was rented by a studio. And then there were a couple of films that I cut at home. Uh, For example, when I worked with Nigel Cole on $5 a Day, which is a film we did after A Lot Like Love, I cut it at my house. And he was in England for a lot of the edit. And he had a copy of all the media and was trying things at his house as well. Oh, wow. So I would just say- How do you like that? I loved it. In his case, I loved it. In his case, I thought he did some great things. It wasn't annoying at all. I don't know if that would be the case with with everyone, Mm -hmm. but I really loved working with Nigel. So we would just pass bins back and forth and it would just link up to, to the media we already had. If I put in a new sound effect- or new music. I had to keep track of that and send that to him by email. But this is long before everyone was working remotely. But there are ways to work remotely in editing that we figured out before lockdown and all of that. And so in certain cases, it was really fun to work from home or work on location. I mean, when I was working on um, The Love Punch, I was telling you with Pierce Brosnan and Emma Thompson, uh, Joel Hopkins' family had this incredible property in uh, near near Tuscany in Italy. So I worked out how to, without an assistant, have everything I needed in this unbelievable, remote, beautiful location. And so we edited there uh, for part of it. And again, it all sounds rosy, except that I had a two-year-old who was screaming for me and I could hear her. At, no matter where she was on the property, my little editing room was a bit of a torturous nightmare because- uh. Yeah, I was being pulled away by my toddler. But um, so, yeah, it sounds good on paper, but it was it was kind of hard. Now, so were they shooting there, too? They were shooting in England, but I was keeping up to picture from home. At that point, I had a summer home in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So they shipped me the media. I was cutting from home in New Jersey. And then I flew with the family over to England and then Italy and finished cutting it there finished the director's cut there. And then we all came back to LA at that point. Is that what happened? I'm trying to remember. Or did they finish it? I think they finished it in England and Paris without me. That's right. That one they, but there's some films that I worked on with Nigel Cole, where I would go over to England just for the director's cut for 10 weeks. And then we'd all come back to LA. So there's been all kinds of situations where I've been on location for a period of time and then finished in New York or LA. I've been on location a lot. In fact, when I first came to LA, every single year I was on location at least three three months out of that year. Mm-hmm. So, it okay, is it like, ah, I'm going to take a break and then I'm going to go down and see what everybody's doing? Like that close? Or you were kind of separated from where they were shooting so you couldn't just like meander down in and see what's going on on set? Right. Well, a lot of times when I was on location, it was after the shoot. So with those British directors, it just so happens it's not a normal situation. But with both Joel Hopkins and Nigel Cole, they were British directors living in England and they wanted to be home for their 10 week director's cut. And so they worked it out with the studio to rent me an editing room, either in Brighton or London, 
And so I wasn't, I was kind of just on my own with the director. There wasn't a, a crew at that point. But on other films, when I have been on location during a shoot, like Charlotte's Web in Australia, we were in South Melbourne. The set was, I can't remember exactly how far away it was, maybe 45 minutes to an hour from where the editing rooms were. And we'd go on set occasionally, but really, honestly, not that often. The reason it was important for us to be on location is that there was a lot of scenes that needed to be locked for the visual effects while we were shooting. And so Gary, the director, um, would shoot five or six days a week. And then on the seventh day, would come into the editing room and start locking scenes that needed to go to the visual effects right away. Mm -hmm. So he was coming into the editing room on the days he wasn't shooting. So that's why we were there. Um, so yeah, I don't go on set that much, even though I, I would enjoy it. It doesn't happen that often. Yeah. That's the bummer part about being an editor is you're kind of, you're alone. Unless you have assistant editors or something, you're really alone with the project and then occasionally with the director that the fun part of networking and meeting new people is usually on set. So, yeah, sometimes, but there is assistance. I mean, on most of these jobs I've worked on, I've had a team, so it doesn't feel alone in that way. And you asked earlier, you know, are the directors in the editing room? And yes, they always are. I've never worked on a film where the director doesn't spend hours in the editing room once I've finished my assembly. So mm -hmm. you have a week or two, if you're lucky, you have that long after they finish shooting to get your assembly together. You screen it for the director and then the director's in the most every day. Sometimes they might have an idea that they want to leave you with. And I like that. I like when, when we come up with a plan and then they leave all afternoon mm -hmm. or they'll give me a day to do a bunch of notes yeah. that we've uh, gone over together. But then they come back in and they're on the couch behind me. If they're telling me what to do, if they're super smart and I respect them like Gary Winnick, I don't mind him saying, Susan, take four frames off the tail of that shot. You know, that's really specific. Um, if it's someone that I don't respect and they're telling me how many frames to take off a shot, that's when I quit, which is what happened on that job. Uh, I figured it was something. <laughs> I just, I, he was not giving me enough respect and just really wanted a pair of hands. And I, I'm at a point where I'm not going to just be a pair of hands for someone. You're there for my ideas, not mm -hmm. just to be a pair of hands on the machine. So, right. You had said that you read the script. And so then I'm assuming that it hasn't been shot yet. Is that correct? Right. Okay. So accepting a job, you read the script. What's your process to getting into the edit? Okay. So I read the script. I meet with the director. Uh, if I don't already know them, like Gary just kept hiring me over and over again. So I was trained by Gary in many ways because I worked with him for so long and he wanted me to rip the thing apart and say what was wrong. He had me on 13 going on 30. He had me take the the printed script and use scissors and start moving things around and tape them a different way before they started shooting. Like he wanted that for me. I made the mistake of interviewing with another director and giving him my blatant honesty, which with what I thought the script needed. And he was the writer of the script and he was pretty offended, but that was his problem. I didn't get the job. We stayed friendly. It's fine. But I don't want to work with someone that I can't be boldly honest with ideas about. Mm -hmm. And so, but I think some people might be a little more sensitive than me. <laughs> I try. I just, I'm a boldly honest person and I say it like it is. So mm -hmm. some people love that and some people don't. And Gary loved it and Nigel loved it. You know, the people I've worked with uh, that, that I continue to work with. So I think my advice, if someone is wanting to be an editor and they're starting out is maybe hold back on the bolder, harsher notes on a script if the person wrote it, but try to feel out how open they are to ideas. If they're not open at all to ideas of yours, you might not want that job. That's just not a fun job mm -hmm. that you're just a pair of hands. So the, the way it goes, just to finish answering your question is that, I read the script, I make notes, I meet with the director, and I kind of suss out how many of those notes I feel comfortable sharing. We see if we get a good vibe in the room, because that's really what it's about, is can you spend a lot of time in a room with this person? <laughs> yes. Right? And so if I get the job, 
I work my ass off during the shoot. I have great assistants helping me out. I let them cut some scenes so that they can learn as well. And we get a great assembly together. And then the director comes in depressed at the end of the shoot, usually, (laughs) because they've shot this film that they've, you know, had something in their head and they don't know if they actually got it on film or not. And they're exhausted, but hopefully they are somewhat heartened by what they see in the assembly. And then we get to work every day together, uh, usually for the director's cut with, with times that I might work on things, like I said, where they go off for the afternoon and I try things. And then we start involving producers and executives if it's a bigger movie. And then there's a lot of voices and there's a lot of notes. And I don't mind the notes process necessarily. I don't try to just reject them because they're producer or executive's notes. They're very smart people that are doing what they're doing for a reason. And I like ticking off boxes. So if I have a list of notes, right. we'll either say, if we really hate the note, We'll say we tried it and it didn't work and you just check it off. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I love it. But a lot of times, you know, you try to be open and say, hey, you know, that's something we didn't think of. Let's give it a shot, especially if it's something that's quick and easy to try. If it's something that's going to pull apart a montage and rework something that you have a lot of sound work, you know, some things take a long time to execute well. And some, th- some things are something you can try quickly and watch it back. Mm-hmm. But you just go through the notes and see which ones you're actually going to try executing. And then you watch, you have to sit back and, you know, hold your arms back from, from doing anything and watch it, try to be objective and watch the whole thing through and make notes because it's hard to stop editing. It, you want to just keep working on it and keep working on it. And you have to get to an end point where you you know, take a step back and watch the whole thing. And that's a good time too to bring in friends and family, have them watch a rough cut of where you're at, either people who've seen it before and might have an opinion of what's changed, or it's always good to have a mix of people who've never seen it before and see what their take is, fresh eyes, you know? Mm -hmm. So you just keep doing that for months. And then you have preview screenings with audience members and you get notes from that until the picture's locked. And at that point, the sound and the composers and the color correct and all the visual effects get finished and you pass the movie over to the distributor. That's a quick version. Are you part of the process of color grading and all of that? Or do you send that off to somebody else? And how about the sound and the mixing? And also um, when you have music, do you go and find all of that or you work with, here's the scene or how does that work? Okay. So on a bigger budget movie, For some reason, I feel like talking about The Ice Storm for a minute. So I was first assistant editor on The Ice Storm, which is one of the best films I've ever worked. Um, Ang Lee directed it. Tim Squires was my mentor for 10 years. He's the editor I worked for most and learned so much from. And Tim is still an incredible editor and still works with Ang Lee. And so I'm going to use him as an example because he's got enough clout at this point that for one thing, he does choose a lot of the songs, but there's always a music supervisor that comes on and suggests songs. They have relationships with publishing houses or artists. 13 Going on 30, we had a f- fantastic music supervisor, John Houlihan. I remember we had Alex Steiermark on the Ice Storm. You know, there's people that are feeding you songs and ideas, but you can try things that you might come up with on your own as well. You have your own music library, whether that's temp score or just needle drops of songs that you might want to use. But sometimes that can be really overbearing and take too much time. There are times when I need to focus on the picture edit and I don't have time to try all these songs. So if you have it in the budget, you can get a music editor to come in and do a temp score with you. We did that on Bride Wars. We had a wonderful music editor I want to name his name, but I can't remember it right now. Sorry, Jay. Can't remember his last name. Um, He came in and he did a fantastic temp score for us because Gary wanted to try to elevate the whole thing and use classical music, which I'm not an expert at. And it also is harder to edit. So we had a, a music editor to just create temp score for us, which doesn't always happen. But so you have other people helping you along the way if you're lucky and there's a budget. Um, mm-hmm. But what happens in the end Again, if there's a budget and you have a good reputation and the way it always used to be is that the editor is very involved in the sound mix and is involved and at the scoring sessions and is involved in the color correction and the DI and finalizing all the visual effects. So what happens after picture lock is that 
you're no longer sitting in the Aeron chair in the computer with the director sitting on the couch behind you. You're now sitting on a couch. I always like that it. part. <laughs> you're now as the editor sitting on a couch in the mix room, you know, giving notes to the mixer or the editors, which you have to keep minimal or they'll get annoyed because they have a lot of work to do and they don't want you interrupting them. But you have an eye and ear for the film that you know certain things don't want to get lost. So you speak up when appropriate, respectfully mm -hmm. to those people. Right. Um, the same with the color correct and the DI. Uh, you, you know, you're the eyes of the film, you're the objective eyes of the film, but the cinematographer, the DP is in the DI and running the DI usually as well, the color correction. Um, but there are- I get that. There are times when the, the DP can't be there and you are in charge of the color in a way as well, or at least giving your opinion. Same with visual effects. You're very on top of making sure that those visual effects are what they should be. So you're overseeing things in the final stages after picture lock in the best case scenario. But I do know that there are low budget films that don't have the budget to keep paying for an editor. And then you're not on the job anymore, which is really a shame. I think it's a shame when that happens, but it does happen. And then you were saying that you have assistant editors, right? So how does that work? Do you hire them or they get hired for you? And then how many do you typically have? And then what is their job versus your job? Yeah, that's a great question. So again, it depends on the budget of the film and the scale of the film. I always hire my own assistants. On 13 Going on 30, that was a huge break for me. I had never done a studio film before as an editor, and so the, the studio kind of mandated the assistant, to, the first assistant editor. I interviewed him, but even when I interviewed him, he said, you know, you pretty much are going to hire me or something. I can't remember what he said, uh, but that was fine with me because I didn't know any studio level first assistant editors and I needed the help. Yeah. So on that film, we had uh, Logan was the first assistant editor. And then under him, because he's kind of running the show at that point, which I did for years as a first assistant in New York, you are running that editing yeah. division. The editor is left free to edit and be creative and work with the director and be a liaison with the producers and the studio. The assistant editor is running the show, which is very complicated and very different from what the editor is doing. So the assistant editor has to make sure that everything that was shot and all the sound that was recorded comes into the editing room. They have to double check with paperwork mm -hmm. that everything that's supposed to be there is there. That's the first thing. They have to make sure that all the sound is sunk properly to the picture, which it used to be their job to sync the dailies, but now the labs usually do it before you get it. But they have to check sync on every take, make sure everything's in sync. They have to be the liaison with the studio regarding whatever daily screenings they're supposed to have. Are they supposed to have every take or is it just the circle takes, the selected takes? So, and they have to create paperwork for the studio to be able to see every take during daily. So there's a lot of work during dailies that happens. Then they're in charge of all the screenings and outputs. If there's like a version of the film, they have to make sure that uh, whoever needs to see that version has a perfect copy of it. They have to watch it back and make sure there's no glitches. Editor, assistant editors do a lot of sound work. They'll add backgrounds and make sure that there's no bumps in them. They'll add dissolves if the music has a pop. You know, they're really like listening for those kind of things. And they'll also... Well, it used to be that we would uh, be in direct contact with the negative cutters when we matched back and that kind of thing. But now when things have to get turned over, they're called turnovers to the to the composer, to the sound department, to the color correct, to the visual effects departments. They're in charge of turning over all the material to those people and making sure it gets back properly and cuts in properly. So it takes a team. On Charlotte's Web, we had men. I can't remember how many there was. Patrick, CC, and then there was a whole slew of visual effects editors. And we all had a, an entire wing of a building at Paramount because there were so many visual effects that people had to take, keep track of. So, and there was a post-production supervisor and two editors. So sometimes there's a big team yeah, and it really needs that many people. Are you seeing more females editors coming up? Well, what I always explain to people that I don't think a lot of people know is that Women have always been prominent in the editing world. 
of course, there came a point where men were probably getting the better, higher paying jobs. But because editors historically were negative cutters before they were editors, or maybe they did some hand coloring, which was super tedious and was always done by women. Uh, Women always had these tedious jobs early on. And so female editors have been very prominent female editors since the get-go, including people like uh, Margaret Booth, who ended up being a very powerful editor for the studios. There was also Dee Dee Allen. Mm -hmm. Thelma Schoonmacher is a very famous editor. Uh, There's always been very powerful female editors that had clout and, and power at the studios. I, it does seem to me, I can't tell you any statistics, but it does seem to me like there are more female editors now that have higher paying jobs with more action, like Debbie Berman, you know, who's a cut Marvel film. Sabrina Plisco has cut Marvel films. Um, I'm, I'm Mary Ellen. Oh God, I can't think of her last name. Mary, Mary Jo Markey, maybe. Anyway, I can't remember. There's There's a lot of powerful female editors that have done action films and are known for it. Even though it's still less common, they're out there. But they've always been out there to a certain degree. Yeah. And maybe sometimes with editing, it's the hidden world a little bit. Yes. I was always kind of curious with a feature film, because it's a lot more media, (laughs) a lot more takes, a lot more, you know, putting together scenes and shots. How do you go about organizing your bins or is that your uh, first assistant editor does that for you? So on a feature film, it's a different process for organizing the bins than it would be on a documentary. But in all cases, it's usually what the editor, how the editor would like it organized. Um, There's kind of a system that most editors use, I noticed. And so I've often copied, if I have an assistant that's worked with another great editor, I'll say, so how do they organize bins? Let me see if I like that, you know? So we kind of borrow each other's organizational process. But usually you have folders Mm -hmm. in the project. And within the folders, you might have a dailies folder. And then it's everything that was shot. Each bin is whatever was shot on a given day in the order in which it was shot. Then you reorganize that footage. You copy it and you put it into scene bins. So you might have scene 14, 27, and 104 that was all shot on that day. And some of those scenes aren't complete. They've just shot part of it. But so you make a bin for that scene and you copy those clips so that you have it by scene. That's usually what the editor cuts from. They don't cut from the dailies bin because they just want to see it by scene in scene order and start building the cut from that. Then you'll have folders of the editor's cuts. And you may have old, you always keep your old versions and and move forward. So you'll have old versions in certain bins. And then the current version is kind of always on top of the project. Then you'll have bins that are full of just sound effects, a bin that or folder full of bins that is just um, temp score or needle drop music. They will have visual effects organized in bins. And so the assistant editor is in charge of keeping that organization, but you have a say of how you want things organized. Right. There'll be a folder at the bottom that's like assistant work that I would never look at because it's a mess. Right. But there'll they'll be a bin of turnovers. Like it's really important to keep track of on what date did this executive watch, you know, and have a snapshot of that version that they watched that they have notes on. Mm-hmm. So you keep that version, you know. So that's how you, but with documentaries, it's a whole different thing because Depending on the documentary, you may organize it in all kinds of ways. You might organize this by subject matter and then figure out how, what order the, the story is going to be told in. You might, And there might be the same um, clip that applies to different subjects. Like when I cut the Spalding Gray documentary and everything is going fine, I noticed when I started listening to the footage that he repeatedly would talk about his mother, stories about his mother. He also would repeatedly kind of have a theme about water. He would talk about water. So I had a water subject bin. And every time he talked about water, I'd make a sub clip of that, put it in the water bin. But if there was something that had talked about his mother and water, that same copy would go into both bins, for example. Right. And then I'd have a version where everything's in chronological order of his life. Or there's a version where everything's in chronological order of when he, when that documentary footage was shot. I mean, there's all different ways to organize things. 
it's you can create the ways that you want to organize. Right. Uh, and it gets a little more complicated with documentaries because you're writing it in the editing. Room. Yeah. Um, more power to all those documentary editors. Absolutely. I do not want to do that. I have so um, much respect for them. Yes. Because like you said, I mean, you are directing it in the edit. I mean, you might have an idea, but it's either going to work or not when you edit. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And I, I love how you're doing that because that's what I was doing when I edit is I edit by scene. So I'll have like my assembly edit of the scene and then I move it into the main and I cut yeah. that way. Um, but how often are you saving your timelines? Is it every day you do the next version or once a week? That's a great question. Um, I learned this from Tim Squires, who was my mentor for a long time. Um, and I assume he still does it this way, although I'm not sure. A version was whenever you output. So my assembly was version zero, my editor's assembly. Yeah. Then you have the first, let's say after two weeks of working with a director, you've decided to have a friends and family screening just to get some feedback. That would be version one, whatever you screened. And then you have notes on version one. You duplicate that, you call it version two, and you keep going. So the way that I take a snapshot is by screenings or outputs that somebody's actually watched that version. If there is something that you want to try, you always have the current cut or it can get very confusing. If you have multiple cuts uh, of versions of a scene and you don't know which one is the one, <laughs> that that's what students sometimes do. And it makes me crazy. You have to pretend that your current version is the version. Even if there's a version of a scene that you might like better, you make a lift spin. Mm -hmm. I have something called lifts. And we used to literally have lifts in film where you'd lift a scene out and you'd set it aside and you'd have a lifts counter or, you know, shelf where there's scenes that you think you might want to put back in, but they're lifted out for right now. So I still call it lifts. And so I have a lift bin, which is either a scene that I've taken out that I'm not sure I might want to put back in, or it's an alt alternate version of a scene, but whatever's in the current cut is the cut and you can have a lift or an alternate versions of things. So, cause otherwise, if it, yeah, you can't, if you did it every day or even every week, unless you're screening every week, it gets overwhelming to have that many versions. Absolutely. And I liked your point of just anytime you're, well, it's really anytime um, you're getting kind of notes too. I mean, I guess you're sending it yeah. out, you're getting notes. That's when you do an another cut because you never know. I mean, I was thankful that I had to do a fight scene, which is not my forte. And I did one version and then I, I overthought about it and I did a different version that was was not good. And I had the director look at it and he's like, uh, no. <laughs> and then I was like, wait a minute. I did do another version. Let's look at this one. He's like, yeah, more like that one. And so thank God that I did that. But that's important. If you're going to rework a scene, you've got to have yeah. you know, older versions because you never know when you're going to have to go back to that. That's absolutely true. Yeah. Yeah. So do you have any tips for aspiring editors that want to get into feature films and editing? Oh, gosh, that's a great question. Um, and of course, I get that question all the time because I'm teaching now. And I think the best advice that I've heard whenever I have guests at UCLA, I, I also ask them because they're more in the business now than I am. You know, I talk about film more than I actually work in film anymore. And so what I, what I did and what I still hear as advice from others is reach out to people you're really inspired by if you can. And if you're thoughtful, hardworking and intelligent, it will show it will show and, you know, volunteer to do work below your abilities at first if you want to work for somebody you admire. And so reach out and say, I'm willing to be a PA. I'm willing to get coffee at first, you know, just to get your foot in the door. And then, uh, you know, it's different than when I started because on film, there were more tasks to do that were physical. You know, I was I was bringing the film from the lab to the editing room every day is carrying it down 10 blocks 
you know, in Times Square in New York. But so there was a lot of physical work to do as an editorial PA back then. But there's still, I believe there's still editorial PAs and ways to get your foot in the door. I believe now it's probably a good idea for you to know Avid and Premier pretty well. I would practice both of those because a lot of professional films and TV shows are using either Avid Media Composer or Premiere. And uh, the more you know those softwares and also um, if you know After Effects, it's a real bonus. So you can try some more kind of temporary visual effects things. Um, That'll be a real asset for you in working with an editor. So I'd say, yeah, try to see what editors you admire and and how you might get your foot in the door. The other thing I'd say is um, after having worked at AFI as, as a teacher there, um, if you're very serious about wanting to be an editor, the graduate program there has great success. They end up, you know, working with directors that are also at AFI. And so you're kind of coming up with your peers. But also if you've gone through the program at AFI, which is quite rigorous graduate program, um, there's a lot of jobs that can be had from there and you've already got your foot in the door somehow. So um, I recommend that as well. Yeah. And I was just thinking because uh, AFI is well known in LA and also uh, great networking yes. opportunities. So yes, brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Susan, for your time. This was such a delight. It was for me too. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening. I encourage you to get out there and make a film. Reach out to your local filmmakers group to get involved and connect. Please subscribe to the show if you like it and follow me on Instagram at Tammy Maguero. Until we meet again, what's your story? <laughs>